Okay, recording. Let me share my screen. All right, folks, let's have a look at the syllabus here. It is now week three right here. Let's make this so we can see the whole thing. Okay, last week you did the sheep brain dorsal and lateral views as a lab activity. <clears throat> you uh, watched the evolution and behavior video and took a quiz on that. You did the gene expression assignment took a and uh, did a quiz on that. And then by Sunday, you took at least one attempt at the genetics and evolution of behavior video. Did anybody run into any problems with that? Okay. And you also read chapter 1.2 nerve impulses, which is what we're going to start today. The other name for nerve impulses is action potentials. Same thing, nerve impulses, action potentials, same thing. Um, <clears throat> your lab activity will be this leech lab, which is kind of fun and it's related to our discussion of action potentials. You'll watch a video reinforcing what we learn about action potentials today. You'll do an assignment on action potentials, no big surprise there, uh, as well as a video on optimizing your studying. I think that'll be helpful. And then the brain basics quiz is due on Sunday. For next week, please have read chapter two synapses. All right, questions on any of that? Hmm, last week's quizzes and assignments were locked for Amanda. Oh, okay. Amanda, would you do me a favor and send me an email and let me know that that was the case and I'll check out and see what's going on there. So they were locked for you before the due date? Some of them will be locked after the due date. Oh, she's new. Okay. Okay. Yeah, send, send me an email, Amanda. We'll work it out. Okay. Let me pull up the, uh, the slides here. Your impulses. Okay. <clears throat> First off, any questions on the evolution of behavior? We did genetics of behavior last week. We learned about gene expression, and then you watched the video on evolution of behavior. Any last, any, any lingering questions on any of that that I can help clarify? Let's see. Okay, we got one. Uh, try found us. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see here. In that case, let's move on. Before we get started on the action potential though, or nerve impulses, let's review the parts of a neuron. All right, I'm gonna call on people at random. I'm gonna be mean here. How about, uh, let's see here. Who should we pick on? How about uh, Geo? Geo, I see you. Geo, what are these little things right here? Uh, the cell membrane? Well, the cell membrane covers the entire oh. cell. Everything in yellow here is covered in a cell membrane. Oh, the dendrites. Beautiful. Those are the dendrites. Good job. Let's see here. How about Alicia? Alicia Ponce. What is this thing here? Honestly, I don't know. Sure, okay, how about, let's see here, should we pick on? Uh, how about Aaron, Aaron Heslin? Oh, you got to unmute. Can you hear me now? Sorry? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm drawing a blank right now, too. Okay, Sorry. Taylor, go ahead. Taylor's got her hand up the nucleus that is the nucleus which resides inside this larger structure which is called what how about amanda what is this whole thing here amanda amanda g 
uh, the soma. The soma, very good. Okay, so we got the dendrites attached to the soma. Inside the soma is the nucleus, as well as you know the mitochondria, uh, all the other parts of the cells that we've talked about, the ribosomes and so forth. That's all in here in the soma. <clears throat> this is the information receiving end of the neuron. What's not normally shown in images like this are all the other um, axons coming in from other neurons, right? So there are other neurons coming in making synapses, points of chemical communication all over these dendrites in the soma, right? So imagine that there's lots of other little wires coming in, sending messages to this neuron by way of little points of communication along the dendrites primarily. So it's receiving this information and it's making one decision at any given moment to have an action potential or not. I know I haven't defined an action potential yet. That's what today's about, but just bear with me for a moment there. Just think of them as electrical signals. The neuron is deciding whether or not to have electrical signals at any given moment. Those signals start right here at a structure called the what? How about Kalin? What's right here? Uh, the axon hillock. That is the axon hillock. Very good. Oh, by the way, these are dendritic spines. These are points where the synapses often occur. Yes, the axon hillock is the base of this long dangly structure hanging off called the what? How about Samantha Guthrie? What is this thing here? The axon. That is the axon. Very good. Now, Many axons, though not all, but certainly axons that travel long distances across our brain or through our body are covered with this kind of insulation, which is called what, Brianna? Um, the myelin sheath. That is the myelin sheath, very good. And then the gaps in between those myelinated sections of the axon, axon are called what? How about uh, Andrew, Andrew Overa? What are these things called? Sorry, I, I don't have my notes with me at the moment. Okay, how about, let's see here. Sarah, Sarah Delellis. What's this thing? The, the gap in between the sections of myelin. You with us, Sarah? I'm not quite sure at the moment. I'm sorry about okay. that. That's all right, anybody? Is it the node? of the rear yes it is it is a okay. node of ranvier it's french so you gotta say it's snooty ranvier <laughs> node of ranvier yes that is a node of ranvier that's the gap we'll talk about those next week and their their role in the action potential so folks this is uh this is like preschool here right so this basic stuff uh again you should be devoting 10 hours a week to this class if you were devoting if you devoted 10 hours a week to this class during the first week you would know this, you would know this inside and out and you need to, you have to, there's no getting around it. You gotta put the time in guys. The stuff that we're doing for the first three chapters here, right? So the uh, gene expression, um, the, uh, the action potentials we're gonna talk about today, the ba you know, what cells are in the nervous system and also synapses. This stuff is like, um, I mean, it's the foundation. It's the building blocks for everything we're going to do for the rest of the semester. Um, and it, it's the most challenging stuff that we're going to do this semester because it's the most abstract. It's the most uh, re far removed from your everyday experience. Um, <clears throat> the rest of the stuff is going to be about memory and emotion and, you know, things that, that, that you sort of re recognize as psychology, but we're going to be exploring how the brain does those things. But at the core of how the brain does each and every one of those things, memory, emotion, um, everything you've ever wanted, desire, has been neurons making synapses, having action potentials. That's it. Neurons having action potentials, communicating with each other at synapses period. You have to understand this or none about nothing else is really going to work. None of it's going to make sense. It's a little bit like eating your vegetables to get to the dessert. 
but this is the best meal ever because it's like two and a half chapters of vegetables and then 10 chapters of dessert after this. Awesome. Best meal ever, but you really have to chew these vegetables in order to enjoy dessert. Okay, please. You made those those schedules, those weekly schedules. Try and follow it, at least for the first few weeks. Get in the habit of doing it. It's really important. You're going to thank me. Okay. Back to what we were doing here. Next up, let's see here. At the end of the axon, you get these axonal branches. And at the end of each branch, you'll find what? How about Alyssa, Alyssa Gonzalez? You with us, Alyssa? Yeah, sorry. Sorry, we couldn't hear you. Sorry, I have no idea. Oh, you have no idea. Got it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, anybody? Uh, Synopsis. They are. They are presynaptic terminals. And the connection with that next cell, which in this case is a muscle fiber, are synapses. These points of communication between cells are synapses. Usually it's between two neurons. But in this case, it's between a neuron and a muscle fiber. That makes this a motor neuron, what's called a motor neuron, because it's involved in moving muscles. We'll learn more about those when we get to the movement chapter. Okay, questions? All right. Yeah, um, Go ahead. I have it written down because I caught like, I drew it myself from the book and um, I have it like synopsis point of communication and like axon terminal so is that okay yes or should I have axon it, like... terminal is the same okay. thing as a presynaptic terminal they're interchangeable okay. they're also some okay. have other names too sometimes they're called synaptic bulbs or presynaptic bulbs I missed the finding yeah um also thought the presynaptic term, terminals could also be nerve endings. Could they be nerve endings? Yeah, um, typically no, no. When people use the term nerve ending, so nerve ending is not a, uh, it's not a term that you'll really find in, in the scientific literature, right? In neuroscience, it's more like a lay term. But usually, my, my sense is that when people use that term, they're referring to sensory neurons in your skin and other parts of your body. Those are the nerve endings that allow you to sense the world around you. Uh, I don't think they're, they're, that term is typically applied to synapses or to synaptic terminals. Good question. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about action potentials, also called nerve impulses. Before we understand nerve impulses, so actually, before we even start talking about nerve impulses or action potentials, let's let's frame it. Let's provide some context. Why it is it we're talking about this? Do me a favor, everybody wave real quick. Okay, now put your hand down. Let's, I'm gonna walk you briefly, very briefly through what had to happen there. The sound of my voice came out of your speakers. It vibrated your cochlea, which vibrated the bones in the inner ear, which vibrated the juice inside the cochlea, which deflected these little these little cilia on what are called hair cells in your cochlea, the organ of hearing. Those deflections caused action potentials, nerve impulses, little electrical signals that travel down the axons of those, those hair cells in the cochlea, travel down the axons, they became part of a nerve, which is a bundle of axons outside the brain and spinal cord. Those axons, the, the action potentials traveling down those axons uh, made synapses with neurons in your brainstem, with the, the dendrites of neurons in your brainstem. The axons coming off those made synapses with neurons in another part of your brainstem, which relayed the signals up to um, part of your thalamus which relayed the signals to superior temporal lobe, which then started extracting the sound of my voice. All of it represented as action potentials, patterns of action potentials within subsets of the 
nearly 100 billion neurons that make up your brain. The temporal lobes and the frontal lobes together start decoding the, the, uh, the pattern of action potentials produced by my voice into word parts and then words and then concepts. The frontal lobes, important for stringing those concepts together, remembering the concepts, decoding them as a, a sentence, in this case, a command. You have to remember the first part of the sentence. And while you're decoding the second part, that involves memory, which involves patterns of action potentials. And then you understood it and you had to decide, do I raise my hand, do I not? Well, he's not gonna see me, my, my camera's off, but maybe I should, I don't know, I don't feel like it. All these thoughts that you're having about whether or not you're gonna raise your hand are patterns of action potentials. We know because we can record those action potentials. We can also manipulate, we can stimulate action potentials and change the pattern of your thoughts and behavior. And then you decide, yeah, okay, I'm gonna raise my hand. You raise your hand. A series of cortical areas in your frontal lobe, as well as the basal ganglia deeper in the brain, communicate with one another to produce a motor plan to raise your arm up. Finally, primary motor cortex, let's say you raise your right hand, primary motor cortex on the left hand side, uh, the, the neurons there send action potentials down their axons through your brain, down your spinal cord, where they make synapses with the dendrites of lower motor neurons in your spinal cord, the axons of which come out and make synapses with the muscles in your shoulder and your arm and cause you to wave. Even the muscle fibers themselves as they contract are having action potentials. <laughs> That's a lot, right? It's all action potentials. That's the key. When we talk about brain activity, we're really talking about action potentials and then the, the signals between neurons, the synaptic communication that's generating or inhibiting action potentials. You can think of them as like the ones and zeros in your computer, right? The, on, the transistors that are either on or off. Uh, they're the, the basic unit of currency of the brain and therefore of the mind. Okay, so that's, that's it. That, that's why we're talking about this. This is at the heart of everything else we're going to do for the rest of the semester and everything you've ever thought and done and will do for the rest of your life. Pretty important. Okay. Uh, is, I see a, a message that you're not able to see me. Uh, I'm not sharing my screen right now. I can, can you guys see me okay? Yes. Okay. Good. All right, back here. So before we understand the action potential, though, we need to learn just a little bit of or just review a little bit of chemistry. Nothing too crazy here. Um, we need to learn about what ions are. They're just atoms or molecules with an electrical charge. That's it. It's a charged particle. So as you know, uh, atoms are made of protons, neutrons and electrons. Protons have a positive charge. Electrons have an equal and opposite negative charge. Typically, they're, they're balanced. You have an equal number. And that's not a charged particle. That is not an ion when they're balanced. But sometimes you have atoms or molecules that have more protons or more electrons. There, there's an imbalance there. And so as a result, they have a positive or negative charge. Those are ions. The two ions that are going to play the biggest role in the action potential, they're not the only ones, but the two that play the most important role are sodium ions and potassium ions. Sodium and potassium are elements. So these are individual atoms. Um, sodium ions have a positive charge. They've got an extra proton, more, one more proton than they do electrons. Potassium ions as well have an extra proton. So they have a positive charge. Each of these have a plus one charge. They have one extra proton. So here's what you need to remember. Sodium and potassium are ions, positive ions. You also need to remember the symbol, symbol the chemical symbol for each of these. Chemical symbol for sodium is Na, for potassium it's K. Um, 
I'll give you a, a mnemonic that might help you with this. Uh, a lot of us in the West ha have too much sodium in our diet. We eat, we eat too much salt. That's not good for you. So if somebody offers you sodium, you say, nah. But, you know, sometimes we don't get enough potassium in our diet. They even put it in, in your multivitamins. So somebody offers you potassium, you say, okay. That's all I got. If you come up with a better one, let me know. Sodium, nah. Potassium, okay. You have to remember it because we're going to be using these symbols rather than writing out these words. Okay? Both positive ions. Both crucial for the action potential. <clears throat> okay. We also need to know what gradients are. A gradient is really just a change in something over space, a gradation. There are two main kind of gradients we need to understand. One is the concentration gradient, also called a chemical gradient. This is where you get a change in the concentration of something over space, how densely packed something is over space. If it's more concentrated in one space, one place than another, then we say that there's a concentration gradient, a change in concentration over space. Okay. Let me, let me draw this out here. Okay. Hmm. Hold on. Why is it just working? Oh, well, we'll use this instead. Okay, so let's say we've got, oh, I see, okay, draw. Okay, we're gonna draw a graph here. I'm doing this with my mouse, so bear with me. Let's say this is space or distance on the bottom. Space. And this will be concentration on the y-axis. If you get a, uh, well, let's say, let's just make it concrete. Let's say that <clears throat> uh, before I leave this room tonight, I open up a bottle of uh, cheap cologne, Axe cologne, over here in the corner by the window and I leave. When I come in in the morning, some of those cologne molecules will have diffused out into the air in the room. Do you think they're gonna be equally concentrated throughout the room? Probably not, right? They're, they're probably gonna be most concentrated over there, right next to the bottle, right next to the window, and probably least concentrated on the other side of the room there. So it would look something like this. This will be uh, by the window, and this will be by the door. So you've got a change in concentration of Axe Cologne, let's say, the concentration of Axe Cologne over space. More concentrated here, less concentrated here. This is a concentration gradient. Pretty straightforward. Here's the crucial thing that you need to know about all gradients, including concentration gradients. Nature hates this. Nature does not like this situation at all. This represents a kind of order or orderliness. And the second law of thermodynamics, the law of, um, um, yeah, the second law of thermodynamics, basically the law of entropy, it's known as, um, makes it such that nature tends to even this out. It tends to create disorder rather than order tends to undo orderly things like this. I'm sort of simplifying it. But, um, if we, if you were to cork up that bottle of Axe Cologne and come back the next day, this is what you'd find. The concentration will have more or less diffused itself evenly across the room. 
Okay. Questions so far? So that's a concentration gradient. Nature hates these concentrations. I have a question. Yes. Sorry. Um, will we be learning about like how the neurons get damaged and um, what ones can repair themselves? We will. Yeah, that'll be okay. uh, the development and plasticity chapter. Okay. Next up, we need to understand electrical gradients, but we've, we've got a lot to understand before. In order to understand how they repair themselves, we have to understand how they work and what they're made of to begin with. So we're building up to it. This stuff, trust me, this stuff is important. You're gonna to wanna to learn this. It's the foundation for everything. Electrical gradients. This is like a concentration gradient, but instead it's a change in electrical charge across space. So if we go back here, and we replace this with uh, charge. Man, it's hard to write with a mouse. Replace this with charge. And let's say this is relatively positive over here, relatively negative down here. And now over space, you've got a change in electrical charge where you've got relatively higher positive charge here compared to over here. That's a change or difference in charge across space. And again, nature hates this, does not like this situation, works to get rid of it. Would prefer to have the charge evened out, have there be no difference in charge across space. In fact, nature hates this difference in charge so much that it will push electrons through a relative insulator like the air. When I was a little kid, uh, my cousins and I used to love to shuffle our feet on the carpet at our grandma's house. She had this beautiful shag carpet. And then we go and sneak up and touch the other person's ear or their nose or something like that. And there'd be a little spark, a little spark would jump from one person to the other. What you were really doing is stripping electrons uh, from the carpet with your feet and, and essentially creating a surplus of electrons on you, such that there was a difference in charge between me and my cousin. Nature doesn't like this. In fact, it, do, it dislikes it so much that it would push those electrons from the tip of my finger to my cousin's ear through the air. You know, not very far, but through the air, creating a superheated plasma in doing so, right? Heating up the air to, you know, thousands of degrees uh, in, in creating that sound and that spark. Nature does not like this. We call this difference in charge, or we call the force that nature is, wants to use to push this charge from one place to another, voltage. Voltage is just a difference in charge between two locations, and it represents electromotive force, the force that nature is, wants to use to push electrons, to push charge from one place to another to even out the charge. Okay, questions so far? So neurons, now we're gonna start applying this, these basic principles to neurons. Neurons, when they're at rest, we say that they are polarized, that the membrane is polarized. All that means is that there's a difference in charge across the cell membrane. Remember that all cells are covered with this plasma membrane or cell membrane, including neurons. But neurons are electrically active cells. And when they're at rest, meaning between action potentials, they have a relative negative charge on the outside. They're more negative on the inside compared to the outside. So we say that the membrane is polarized. This difference in electrical potential or voltage across the membrane is known as the resting potential. Whenever you see the word potential in the context of science or electricity, physics, typically we're talking about electrical potential, which is again, a difference in charge. It's like potential energy stored up as a difference in charge between two locations. And it's potential energy because again, nature hates this. You had to work to separate those charges 
and nature is going to work to put them back so you can use that stored up energy to do stuff like a battery and that's what the neuron does as we're going to see okay so there's an electrical potential or voltage across the membrane this is called the resting potential the inside of a neuron is about negative 70 millivolts compared to the outside just for reference a uh, a double a battery is typically going to have one cell in it, uh, one photo, photo, one volt, uh, sorry, one pile or a chemical cell, which is typically about one and a half volts. So your, your AA battery, one and a half volts between the two ends of it. That's 1,500 millivolts. There's a thousand millivolts in a volt. So this is 70 thousandths of a volt or seven hundredths of a volt. So this is pretty small. This is not a big difference in charge, but it is enough to get the job done, as we're going to see. Okay, so that's called the resting potential. It's uh, <clears throat> this is a little bit counterintuitive, I think. Um, when I think of rest, I think of being in my hammock, relaxing, maybe drinking a cocktail. Uh, but neurons, when they're at rest they're actually in this sort of unstable state where they're more negative on the inside than the outside. And as we'll see, it takes effort, it takes energy to create and maintain this resting potential. So it's at rest only in the sense that it's in between action potentials, but it's definitely not like a relaxed state. It's, a, it's like a, 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 a trap ready to spring. We can measure this difference in voltage across the membrane, this difference in charge with microelectrodes. Whenever you're measuring voltage, differences in electrical charge, you always need two electrodes because again, it's a difference in charge between two, two places in space. In this case, you stick one microelectrode, not drawn to scale here, inside a neuron, and then another one, a reference electrode outside the neuron somewhere in the interstitial fluid, we call it the fluid in between the neurons. And then you amplify the tiny changes, the tiny differences in voltage, right? Or the changes in charge across the membrane. You amplify those differences and then record and display them on a computer. Over here, you're seeing a microelectrode actually getting ready to puncture a neuron. Typically, this is a piece of tungsten, tungsten metal that's drawn out very fine and then coated with an insulator except for the very, very tip. Okay, questions? All right, moving on. Next thing you need to understand, <clears throat> the cell membrane is covered with proteins that act as gates or channels for ions. So we call them ion channels. And in the channels are these gates that open and close to either let ions through or to stop the flow of ions. Again, they're proteins. Remember, everything is proteins. If the cell needs something done, it makes a protein to do it, or it makes a protein to make the molecule that it needs to get the thing done. So you have genes that when they are expressed, transcribed and translated, make these special proteins, thousands of amino acids strung together in the right sequence to create a little machine that embeds itself in the cell membrane and acts like a tube, one that opens and closes at specific moments, as we'll see, or under specific conditions. Okay, so these gates are channeled or embedded in a membrane. And that's what you're seeing here. This represents the cell membrane spreading out in the distance here. It's a phospholipid bilayer. You're seeing the phospholipid molecules here, phosphate head, lipid tails pointing at each other. And embedded in that, and here's the inside of the neuron. And then here's the outside of the neuron. And embedded in that membrane, you're seeing ion channels represented as these little tubes 
Some of them are open, like this one and these two. Some of them are closed, like these two. These ion channels are proteins, as I mentioned, thousands of amino acids strung together to make this machine that opens and closes under certain conditions. And they're specific. So for example, this is a sodium channel. You can see it's only letting these green colored sodium ions through. This is a potassium channel. It will only let potassium ions through. So they're ion specific, they're selective for specific ions. Here's another sodium channel down here. Think back for a moment to the, uh, our discussion of the blood-brain barrier. You might remember that certain things get through the blood-brain barrier passively. Fat-soluble molecules, small uncharged molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Reason is those things pass through the cell membrane passively. The blood brain barrier is really just the cell membrane of the cells that make up the walls of the blood vessels in the brain. So that to get from the blood to the brain, it has to go through those cell membranes. Same thing with your neurons. They have a cell membrane and the cell membrane has the same properties. Charged particles can't get through. Ions cannot get through the cell membrane. Can you guys hear me? My connection says it's unstable. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Good, good. I can hear you. Good. So ions don't get through. Sodium ions, potassium ions, they can't just dissolve through. They can't just pass through on their own. In order to get through the membrane, these charged particles, these ions, have to eat, have to go through a channel or they have to be actively pumped in using another kind of protein. So that's why this is critical. In order to have electrically active cells, you've got to move these electrons through the membrane by pumping them through or letting, letting them through these channels, which open and close, as I mentioned, under circumstances that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So the neuron's membrane, it's selectively permeable, just like the blood-brain barrier, because it's blood-brain barrier is made of the same stuff, cell membrane. Some stuff gets through, some stuff does not. During the resting potential, potassium channels and the gates within them are mostly closed. This is important. Potassium channels are mostly closed, but what that means is that they're partly open. So some potassium can pass through the membrane when the neuron is at rest. Again, so far, at first, we're going to talk about the resting potential because it sets the stage for the action potential. To understand how the action potential works, you've got to understand the resting state and how the neuron gets there. So in the resting state, between action potentials, the potassium channels are closed. So potassium can pass through the membrane a little bit. The sodium channels, however, are pretty much slammed shut. There's virtually no sodium moving through the membrane when the neuron is at rest. This is an important thing to remember about neurons at rest. Sodium channels are closed when they are at rest. Sodium can't get through the membrane. Okay, so those are the channels. There's this other thing you need to know about, this other kind of molecule. It's actually uh, a compound molecule. There are two separate proteins that come together to form something called the sodium potassium pump. It's also called sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, and we'll see why in a minute. So it's a protein complex composed of two separate proteins. Two separate genes get expressed as two separate proteins. They come together and form this little machine, this little molecular machine, whose only job is to transport three sodium ions out of the cell and draw two potassium ions into the cell with each cycle. So it's a little machine, a little pump that runs in a cycle. Three sodiums out, 
two potassiums in, three sodiums out of the cell, two potassiums in, three out, two in, three out, two in, all day long, pumping, 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 pumping. These little machines never stop. They're distributed throughout the membrane for the most part, and they're just constantly pumping. Three sodium ions out, two potassium ions in. It's an active transport mechanism. It requires energy to function. Um, anybody remember the, the convenient source of energy that most cellular functions rely on? ATP. ATP, that's right. Adenosine triphosphate, uh, mitochondria help produce that. This relies on ATP. So the ATP molecule binds to this protein complex, the sodium potassium pump, and changes its shape. And then a phosphate pops off the ATP, making it ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And then it changes its shape again. And then the ATP pop or ADP pops off and then another ATP pops on and it repeats the whole process. So basically with each cycle, it's popping off a phosphate and it's using the ener energy in that phosphate bond to run the pump. So it takes energy to function. So right now, every neuron in your body, and there's you know something like 80 to 100 billion just in your brain, they're all doing this constantly, creating and maintaining uh, or constantly moving these ions through the membrane, using up your precious Oreo cookies or whatever you had as a snack today in order to do that. As a result of this pump, the sodium potassium pump, you end up with about 10 times more sodium on the outside of the neuron than on the inside. What do you call that when you have a difference in concentration over space? Not equilibrium. No, that would be when you have the same concentration. Concentration gradient. That is a concentration gradient when you have a difference in concentration over space. So this, this pump creates a really intense, a really big concentration gradient for sodium. It also creates a concentration gradient for pot potassium, but not quite as strong. Okay. Questions? No? What happens if the system like um, gets out of harmony, like if it stops working, like what essentially happens? Nothing good. Uh, so in, in order for this system to stop, right, in order for your neurons to no longer produce, to no longer pump these sodium ions across the membrane and produce the resting potential, um, the cell would actually have to die. I mean, really, it, it would either have to completely run out of energy, run out of ATP, uh, or something else sort of catastrophic would have to happen to make your mitochondria stop functioning. Uh, that can happen in the case of a stroke, for example, where you lose oxygen, right? you need oxygen to make the ATP, or you lose the, the glucose, or if uh, if the um, the concentration of certain electrolytes inside the cell changes, or out, I'm sorry, outside the cell changes dramatically, uh, like if blood gets into the interstitial fluid, that can also cause things to fail. But the neurons stop working is, is the answer. And if the neurons aren't working, you're not working. Your brain's not working. Okay. This is representing what I just showed to you graphically. So imagine that this tube is a little section of axon. So that makes this yellow thing, the cell membrane. This is the inside of the axon, the inside of the neuron. This is the outside of the axon. Remember that the axon is just an extension of the neuron. So it's the inside here is the same as the outside, wherever you are in the cell, or the, the neuron. You can see that this is sort of schematically showing you what the sodium potassium bump, pump does. It pumps three sodiums out and two potassiums in with each cycle. 
three sodiums out, two potassiums in, three out, two in, three out, two in, all day long, pumping, pumping, pumping. So this represents what the pumps are doing. As a result, you end up with lots of sodium outside the cell compared to inside. Lots of Na pluses out here, not so many in here. You also end up with more potassium on the inside the cell oops, than outside. So you see lots of potassiums in here, the K plus, fewer potassiums out here. So you have two concentration gradients going in different directions here. Sodium concentration is concentrated outside, potassium concentrated on the inside. Also, well, let's hold, hold off on that. So first off, does nature like this situation with all the sodium outside and very little on the inside? No. Nature hates this. Nature hates this. So why, why doesn't nature just push these sodiums back into the cell? Because the channels are closed. Ah, because the channels are closed. Right? These sodium channels, you're seeing two of them open here, but when the neurons at rest, they are pretty much all closed. So the sodium wants to get in. Nature wants to move uh, these sodiums where there are fewer sodiums. I think your book gives the example of like, imagine you've got two adjacent rooms. One's filled with 100 cats and one's only got 10 cats in it. If you open the door between the rooms, you might get one or two cats from the 10 side go over to the 100 side, but mostly you're going to get the cats kind of evening themselves out. So they're not so you know piled on top of one another in that one little room. Same thing here. Oops. These, these sodiums, these cations, want to go where there are fewer sodiums. These potassiums want to even themselves out. Nature wants to even out these concentration gradients, but it can't. It can't push these sodiums in because the, the channels are closed. Okay. As, and also, as I mentioned, when the neuron is at rest, so again, this whole situation here is what's happening when the neuron is at rest before the action potential occurs. The inside of the neuron is negative 70 millivolts, roughly. So it's more negative on the inside than the outside. So does nature like that situation? No. Doesn't like that either, right? What's that called? And you got a difference in charge over space. An electrical gradient? That is an electrical gradient that differs in charge across the membrane. The membrane is polarized at rest, like our current political climate, right? You're not neutral. Nobody's neutral. <laughs> uh, there, there's an uneven distribution of charge here on one side or the other. In this case, there's more negative charge on the inside compared to the outside. So if you think about what's happening to the sodium, right, the forces acting on the sodium, its concentration gradient wants it inside. Nature wants to put the cats where there are fewer cats. It wants to put the sodiums where there are fewer sodiums and even things out. Also, the inside is negative and this sodium is positive. So nature wants the sodium inside for that reason as well, to get rid of this electrical gradient. So sodium has these two forces tending to draw it inside, but it can't go in because the gates are closed. So what do you think is going to happen when we open those gates? Flood to both sides. Say again? Like um, they're going to work so that they're going to move to the other side, wherever they're supposed to be. That sodium is going to rush explosively into the cell, drawn in by or pushed in by the electrical gradient, nature trying to get rid of the electrical gradient and trying to get rid of the concentration gradient. <clears throat> what we would, the, the technical way to say it is that it would move down its electrochemical gradient. Okay, let's think about those same two forces now, but in terms of the potassium. So the potassium is concentrated on the inside so where does the concentration gradient want to put potassium? Outside. Outside. And that's represented over here, right? 
the cats want to go where there are fewer cats. So the potassium wants to go out for that reason to eliminate the concentration gradient. But the inside of the cell is negative and potassium is positive. So moving that potassium out would only make the electrical gradient worse. So the electrical gradient tends to want to keep it in. So potassium, you have the same two forces working on it, concentration gradient and electrical gradient, but they're, they're acting in opposite directions. One tending to push it out, the concentration gradient, one tending to pull it in, the electrical gradient. They're almost even, they're almost balanced, but the concentration gradient is actually a little bit stronger usually than the electrical gradient. So when those potassium, if you were to open up those potassium channels wide, they would tend to flow out, but they wouldn't explode out. They wouldn't rush out the way the sodium would rush or explode into the cell because it has those two forces working in the same direction. Why is the concentrating or concentration gradient stronger? Yeah, um, I can't give you a, uh, so the, <laughs> you, you would need to talk to a biophysicist to get the really detailed explanation of that. Uh, I'll just say that if the concentration in here was a bit less, if the concentration gradient was smaller, they'd probably be evened out. If the electrical gradient was larger, they'd probably even out. Um, but each of these things, the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient generates these forces independently. And it just so happens that when the neuron is at rest, the forces are balanced or almost balanced in such a way that the concentration gradient is just a bit stronger. And potassium is moving in both directions, even at resting or no? Typically, no. So those potassium channels are open, but because the concentration gradient is strong, is a bit stronger, it tends to flow out through the channels. But remember that it's being pumped in by the pump. So it's moving in by way of the pump, actively forcing it in, but then it's passively moving out because some of those potassium channels are open. So it's is there, go ahead. Is there ever a chance where the inside has little or no sodium because of the pump? Because it's like three out. So would there ever be none inside? Fantastic question, right? So you, you, this may have occurred to some of you, like if this pump is pumping all the time and you don't have an action potential, wouldn't you eventually run out of sodium? And the answer is no, because it turns out neurons also have these things called leak channels. There are a few sodium channels scattered across the membrane that just stay open. They're not, they're not voltage gated, as we're going to see. Most of these channels are voltage gated. They open and close in response to changes in voltage. But there are some that just stay open. They just leak. How many are there? The concentration is calibrated uh, such that when you get to about negative 70 millivolts, the outward leakage, or I'm sorry, the inward leakage roughly balances the outward flow produced by the pumps. So the pumps are pumping sodium out, but there's also sodium leaking in. At about negative 70 millivolts, those two flows are roughly equal. So that's where, that's the, the sort of set point or equilibrium point for voltage for a neuron. And equilibrium for a neuron is, what is equilibrium for the neuron? Well, in this case, uh, I'm using equilibrium to uh, describe the, the sort of um, the balance point where the resting neuron, the resting neuron's voltage stabilizes. So at negative 70, you won't get, typically won't get too much past negative 70 millivolts unless there's a perturbation, we'll talk like, like synaptic input, for example, um, because at that point, right, the, basically the bigger the concentration gradient and the bigger the electrical gradient, the more force is pushing sodium ions in through those leak channels. So 
if you get much past negative 70, then you get more leaking in. If you get less than negative 70, you get less leaking in. Oops. So this is the voltage at which the outward moving sodium from the pump, the action of the pump equals the leaking sodium coming in. Thank you. Sure. Okay, it's 8.01 guys. Let's, uh, let's take a five minute break. I know this is pretty heavy stuff. Get up, stretch, get some water, go to the bathroom. We're gonna come back, let's say at 8.05. Let's come back at 8.05 and continue, okay? I'll start recording again. All right, been any, uh, any questions spring to mind during the break? Sorry? Like the, like the calmer, what's like the logo on your shirt, the graphic? Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> my wife got it for me. It says calmer than you are. It's a reference mm -hmm. to uh, the movie, The Big Lebowski. I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm a big fan of that movie, The Big Lebowski. If you haven't seen it, that's, uh, it's required, required viewing for this class. It's got nothing to do with the class, but you should watch it anyway. <laughs> and it's also kind of a reference to the uh, keep calm and carry on you know, from World War II. When the Big Lebowski here, I'll put it in the message board. Lebowski, The Big Lebowski. Fantastic movie, Coen Brothers movie from the 90s. Oh, that was a direct message. I'll do that to everybody, hold on, Big Lebowski. There we go. Okay, let's continue. So there was a question from Amanda. Does this mean that neuron at rest is when a sensory or electrical pulse is not being sent within the body. It's when that neuron is not having an electrical impulse, right? When it's the neuron is not having an action potential. When you're asleep, you do have fewer, but even when you're asleep, your brain's running at like 80% or it, it's um, metabolic consumption, right? The, the energy that it's using is still like 80% of where it's at when you're awake. So even when you're asleep, your brain, is, your brain is less active, but it's not like it's inactive, right? It's still a very, very active organ. Uh, you're still having lots of action potentials when you're asleep. So the pattern of action potential changes, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to that chapter. Uh, Abigail says, is there, so there's a constant movement of chemicals. Yes, there is. Yeah, these, those sodium potassium pumps are constantly pumping sodium ions out, uh, potassium ions in, and they're leaking through the membrane, even when the membrane is at rest. And then, as we're going to see when we have an action potential, there are huge changes, right? Huge changes in the flow of these, uh, these ions through the membrane. Let's see that right now. Okay, so just to summarize, you got these two forces at work on the sodium ions when the neuron is at rest the electrical gradient tending to pull those sodium ions in the concentration gradient also tending to pull it in right but the electrical and the concentration gradient want those sodium ions inside the cell but they can't get in because the gates are closed the voltage gated sodium channels are closed <clears throat> the same forces are acting on potassium but they're acting in opposite directions um, that said, if you were to leave the potassium channels wide open, the potassium would tend to flow out of the cell. In other words, the, the concentration gradient is a bit stronger than the electrical gradient. But it wouldn't rush at it, it wouldn't explode out the way the sodium ions would explode in because the two forces are acting in the same direction. Okay, big picture question, why bother? with this resting potential. Why do this? Why, why use up all the energy from your, your Twinkies to generate these gradients that nature hates, right? Why fight nature? Why generate this electrical gradient? Why generate and maintain these concentration gradients? And the, uh, the answer is speed. So uh, I some edition of, of your book gave a, an example of uh, a bow hunter. I don't hunt, but let, 
let's just use it as an example. So imagine you're out in the woods and there's a little clearing in the woods and you know that the deer are going to walk past that clearing, but it's a pretty narrow gap through the trees. So you have a couple of options. You could wait until you see a deer trotting across and then draw back your bow and fire, but you run the risk of missing. You run the risk of being too slow. The alternative would be to draw back the bow and hold it there so that the moment you see it, the moment you get the signal, you can let the arrow fly. You can release that pent up energy, that potential energy that you've deposited in the bow by drawing it back. That's the, the mechanism that nature hit upon pretty early on in evolution. So the action potential has been in this form for at least half a billion years. Basically every animal that has neurons, that has uh, electrically active cells, uses the same exact system with very, very subtle modifications. Um, once nature hit upon it, it just reused the same mechanism throughout evolution. We, we just kept it. But it comes at a high cost, right? Generating and maintaining these action potentials and these resting potentials, fighting nature all the time, takes a lot of energy. It gives you speed, allows the neurons to respond very quickly, <clears throat> but the brain consumes 15 to 20% of your body's oxygen and up to a quarter of its glucose when you're just sitting around. It's only 2% of the, your body's weight, typically. It only weighs about three pounds. So if you weigh 150 pounds, it's 2% of your body weight. But it's consuming up to a quarter of your body's metabolic resources, right? This is a very, very demanding type of tissue, very metabolically demanding tissue. It comes at a high metabolic cost. This is why you don't really see huge brains throughout the animal kingdom, right? I mean, why wouldn't, why wouldn't cockroaches have great big brains? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that help them out? Well, it, it might help them to have bigger brains, but uh, it would come at a much, at, at a cost. They'd have to eat a lot more. They'd have to find a lot more food. That extra brain would have to earn its keep by allowing the animals to, to find more food to power the big brains. And cockroaches seem to do just fine with the brains they have, given their ecological niche. Okay, the other aspect uh, of this high metabolic demand is the blood brain barrier. You might remember that pretty much everything the brain needs uh, to run the glucose, the amino acids it needs to build proteins and so forth. All of that has to be actively transported through the blood brain barrier. Active transport is basically kind of like the sodium potassium pump. It's using ATP to move these molecules and, and atoms through the blood brain barrier, through the cell membranes of the blood vessels, of the, the cells that make up the blood vessel walls within the brain. Okay, so now we come to it. Now we come to the action potential itself. I'm going to start with a few definitions here, and then we're, we'll, we'll sort of dive into the big picture of how this all works, okay? So, the, um, the membrane, here, let, this might be, uh, let's do this, it'll be easier to show this to you, clear all drawings, okay, so let's say, that we've got an electrode in the axon hillock of a neuron and then another electrode outside the neuron so we've got an intracellular and an extracellular electrode and we're comparing the voltage comparing the charge between the inside and the outside and we're measuring that difference in charge as millivolts thousandths of a volt on the y-axis here and then we'll see how it changes over time Okay, so when the neuron's at rest, here's zero. What's the voltage inside the neuron when it's at rest? Anybody? Negative 70 millivolts. You got it. The resting potential is about negative 70 millivolts. Right about there, let's say. <clears throat> 
So you're bopping along at rest. Now, if you, it, it's possible to get um, synaptic input signals from other neurons that make the neuron even more polarized. So again, when the neuron is at rest, we say that it's polarized. It's not relaxed. It's in an electrically uh, charged state. It's not neutral. Zero is neutral. This isn't neutral. It's negative on the inside. So it's polarized. If you make it even more polarized, push it further from zero, we call that hyperpolarization. So I can type that out rather than try and write it. So that's a hyperpolarization. All right. And then synaptic input can also depolarize the neuron a little bit, make it less polarized, more neutral, closer to zero. So that's what this is called. Okay, you guys are with me so far? So when the neuron is at rest, it's polarized. Negative 70 is polarized. If it, it becomes even more polarized, like negative 80, it's hyperpolarized. If it becomes less polarized, then it becomes depolarized. If you depolarize the neuron enough, again, typically because of it's, this is a, a result of synaptic inputs, signals from other neurons, then you reach something called the threshold of excitation. Usually it's going to be around negative 55 or so, but it, it'll vary from moment to moment and from neuron to neuron. So that's the T or the threshold of excitation. When you hit that, something crucial happens. And you, you guys should be drawing this or at least, you know, taking a screenshot or something so you can go back and look at it. Uh, let's see here, format. The critical thing that happens is, let's make this green. The sodium channels open. Okay, so at the threshold, at that, at that level of depolarization, those voltage gated sodium channels open. So these channels that I've been talking about, the, the sodium channels, I told you they open and close. They do so in re response to changes in voltage. At about negative 55, they pop open. I'm sort of simplifying here. I'll give you more details later, but just to get you over, get you the, the main idea. At about negative 55, the sodium channels open. They're voltage gated, they open. And what's going to happen, folks, when you open those voltage-gated sodium channels? Sodium rushes in. The sodium is going to explode into the cell, right? So let's go back here. That sodium, right now, those sodium channels, they're not shown here, but they're closed. If you open up those sodium channels, that sodium is going to rush explosively into the cell. As those positive ions rush in, what's going to happen to the voltage? What do you think? Is it going to become more negative or more positive? More positive. It's going to become more positive. Just like this. Let's change the color. The cell rapidly depolarizes and even goes past zero, goes past neutral, up to positive 30 or 40 millivolts. There's kind of an inertia. You could think of it as an inertia. The, the sodium rushes out very quickly and overshoots neutral and goes up into positive territory. Roughly at the peak, 
those sodium channels start to close. I apologize, that's not a straight line. You should be straight lines here. Okay, <clears throat> the sodium channels are open for that sort of brief window here during what's called the rising phase of the action potential right here. So at this moment, at the threshold, at this level of depolarization, when the sodium channels open, that's when the action potential begins. You've initiated the action potential right here by hitting the threshold, by depolarizing the cell enough so that those sodium channels open. And that, that's what changes everything. That kicks off the rest of the changes. A cascade of things then happen. Step one, the sodium channels open and sodium rushes explosively into the cell, carrying its positive charge with it, making the inside more and more positive until it gets to the peak of the action potential. Roughly at the peak, the potassium channels open. Let's make that red. The potassium channels open. Now, let's go back here. Okay. So the sodium just rushed in. So now imagine all these Nas are in here. But the potassium is still in there at this point. So now the sodium is rushed in. The inside of the cell, it's not negative 70 anymore. It's now positive 30 or 40. <clears throat> and then the potassium channels open up wide. They were already a little leaky, but now they fly open. They're wide open. They're also voltage gated. And that depolarization causes them to open that rapid depolarization that you saw as a result of the sodium rushing in. So now, where's that potassium going to go? What do you think? Well, let's think about the two forces acting on it now. Where is the sodium, where's the potassium concentrated? It's concentrated on the inside, right? So the concentration gradient wants to pull it out. How about the electrical gradient? Well, now at the peak of the action potential, it's positive on the inside. So now the electrical gradient also wants it out, right? It's now positive on the inside. It's a positive ion. Nature wants to push that out to get rid of this positive charge on the inside of the cell. So now both the concentration and the electrical gradient want that potassium out when you're at the peak of the action potential. So when those potassium channels open, they fly out of the cell. They rush explosively out of the cell. As they rush out, they carry their positive charge with them, which leaves the inside of the cell. Remember, that's what we're plotting here. That's what we're graphing out is the charge on the inside of the cell. So as those positive potassium ions rush out of the cell, they carry their positive charge with them, leaving the inside of the cell more and more and more negative. In fact, you get this, what's called an undershoot here, before the cell finally stabilizes back. Oops. Let's try it again. Get an undershoot. And then it finally stabilizes back at the resting potential, about negative 70 millivolts. That stabilization roughly corresponds to when the potassium channels close. So the potassium channels, they take longer to open and they stay open longer than the potassium channels did. And that's the action potential in a nutshell there. Let's review it. Actually, no, let's hold up. Yeah, let's review it real quick. So you hit the threshold, typically as a result of excitatory synaptic inputs. The, the threshold is just a level of depolarization where those sodium channels open, the voltage-gated sodium channels. That lets sodium rush explosively into the cell. Because it's, remember, it starts out at rest, concentrated outside of the cell because of the pump. And then 
the sodium gates close roughly at the peak, but the potassium gates start to open. The potassium is concentrated on the inside and the inside's now positive. So it's going to fly out of the cell when those potassium channels open up and they open up and that's where it goes. It rushes out of the cell. It continues rushing out because the channels are wider open than they normally are here. But eventually as the, poten the, the potassium channels start closing again, you get less and less potassium rushing out and you get back to your sort of equilibrium state at about negative 70. Okay, I know it's a lot, guys. It's going to take time. You're going to have to look at this, not once, not twice. You're going to have to look at it several times this week, several times next week. You're going to have an assignment and some more videos to watch on this. And then we're going to review it again next week. It's that important. And it, but it is a little bit challenging, right? None, none of the little pieces is that hard to remember. You can remember that sodium and potassium are positive. You can remember where, what the, the pump does. You can remember that sodium is the first, sodium channels opening is the first thing that happens when you reach the threshold. You can remember each one of these little things, but it's gonna take time. And then it's also gonna take time for all the little pieces to kind of fit together, for you to see them as kind of a machine, all little parts of a machine that has to work the way that it does. Speaking of remembering what's happening during the, uh, the resting potential. Let me uh, let me show you another whiteboard here. Let's save this. Okay, I'm gonna clear this. Let's go back here again. So this is the resting state of the neuron. <clears throat> if you remember this, it's really easy to remember, or it's much easier to remember how the action potential works. What do you have to remember here? You have to remember where the sodium is concentrated and where the potassium is concentrated. And you have to remember the charge on the inside of the cell. To remember those things, the easiest way I think to remember those things is to remember what the pump does. The pump is the key to all of it. And to that end, I have a song for you to help you remember this. Here are the lyrics. So this is the sodium potassium pump song. So this song tells you what the pump does. Okay, here are the lyrics. Na 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 out. KK goes inside. Oops. That's it. Those are the lyrics. Here's how it goes. Na 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 out. Na 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 out. KK goes inside. Got it? Everybody, everybody with me now. Here we go. Na 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 out. Na 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 out. I can't hear you. KK goes inside. inside. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody chimed in. All right. <laughs> so remember the song. Learn the song. Let's go back here. So if you remember the pump song, what do you remember? It tells you everything you need to know. Let me show you. If you remember that na 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 goes out, na na na, three sodiums out, that tells you the potassium, or I'm sorry, yeah, the uh, sodium concentration gradient. Where's sodium concentrated? Outside. That's right, outside. So the key, is, the key to the action potential is remembering the gradients in, at rest. Oops. Yeah, I can't type today. Sodium is concentrated inside. Where's potassium concentrated? I'm sorry, not inside, outside. Duh. Okay, yes, no, 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 out. It's concentrated outside. Potassium, of course, is concentrated inside. So the pump song tells you where the two ions are concentrated. 
it also tells you about the electrical gradient. Let me show you. You've got three positive ions. Oops, it's not gonna let me do it now, but these are three positive ions going out, but only two positive ions going in. These are both plus one charges, so they have the same charge. A, pos a, a sodium and a potassium ion have the same amount of positive charge. So you're getting three positive ions leaving the cell for every two positive ions coming in. That doesn't add up. You've got more positive stuff leaving than you have coming in. That leaves the inside of the cell more negative. You with me here? So you remember the pump? You remember that sodium's concentrated outside? Na 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 out. You remember that potassium's concentrated inside? KK goes inside. And you remember that the inside is negative, relatively negative, because there's more positive ions leaving than there are coming in. What's not shown here is all the other garbage inside the cell, right? There's all sorts of other proteins and ions and, you know, just molecules and, and atoms with various charges. So there's lots of other stuff in here. But if you're moving more positive stuff out than you're bringing in, you're going to get a net negative charge on the inside. Okay, questions? No? Okay, what you should do, tomorrow or the next day, you should go and look at the rest of these slides, right? So this just summarizes, oops, this summarizes the stuff I just showed you. Hyperpolarization, depolarization, it gives you the definitions of these things. And then it shows you, by the way, everything that I just showed you there, once you hit that threshold, this peak, this rising phase and falling phase lasts about one millisecond, one one thousandth of a second. Your neurons can do this up to 200 times a second. They can't keep it up very long that fast, but there are neurons that can generate 200 action potentials a second. And it's happening, they're happening typically several times a second at least in every neuron in your brain all the time. What's mainly changing as your brain activity changes and as you're thinking different things and doing th different things, what's really changing is which neurons are more or less active. The pattern of activity. So again, when we're talking about brain activity, we're mostly just talking about the rate of these action poten potentials across different uh, circuits and networks of neurons in your brain. Okay, please review the rest of the slides up to action potential propagation. This slide here I think will be especially helpful for you. This is just summarizing as a little cycle everything that we just saw. Let me just walk you through it. I know it's 8.30, so if you have to go, you can go, but this will be recorded. You can go back and watch it. So here's the action potential. You get steps one, two, three, four, five, and then back to one. Let's look at step one. That's the resting state. Here's the, the neuron's membrane. You can see it's relatively positive on the outside, negative on the inside, the pluses and the minuses. You can see the sodium channels are shut. Sodium cannot come in. The potassium channels, it's only showing you one and it's shut because mostly they're shut. But then you get some depolarization happening here. Again, typically as a result of synaptic uh, excitation, ex excitatory signals from other neurons. That's gonna cause these, some of these sodium channels to open and start letting some sodium in. Once you reach the threshold right here, those sodium channels all pop open and the sodium rushes explosively into the cell, carrying its positive charge with it, this rising phase here, making the inside of the cell positive. So the pluses, plus signs on the inside now. By the way, it also makes the outside slightly negative comparatively for a brief moment. And then at the peak, those sodium channels close. Notice that on the falling phase, they're closed here. This is step four, the falling phase. 
But now the potassium channels are open and those potassium ions can rush out and they do. They rush out explosively, carrying their positive charge with them, making the inside of the cell more and more and more negative again. Minus signs on the inside. But those potassium channels stay open for a while. And that's why you get this undershoot here. You get more potassium flowing out than you do when the cell is at rest. And as a result, you stay more hyperpolarized, more negative than when the cell is at rest. But eventually, those potassium channels shut and you're back to your resting state. Okay, I got a question here from Amanda. So only positive goes inside if the voltage is negative. Positive goes inside. Hmm. Not sure I not sure I fully understand the question. Molecules are negative. Well, you're asking about sort of hypotheticals. If these were, you know, negative ions, I it's hard to speculate about that, right? This is the system that that nature kind of hit upon. Uh, and it worked, and so it, it's just retained this this system in all uh, all animals, all every every organism really that has excitable membranes in their cells. Okay, that's it for tonight, guys. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for another few minutes. But I'll also have office hours tomorrow here, same Zoom link uh, from eight to nine. If you can't make those, just shoot me an email. Uh, or give me a call, and uh, I'm happy to, to meet with you outside those hours if I'm able to. All right, good work, folks. Please look at this carefully. Review it. 10 hours a week, bare minimum, okay? You're going to ace this class if you do that. All right, have a good night, folks. Take care. Thank you. Have a good night.